have you ever been sharing a story with a group of friends? And uh, when someone is in that group of friends and you're sharing that story and you're in mid-thought sharing uh, a remembrance and that person suddenly interjects and says, no, 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 that's not what happened. This is what happened, right? And, you, and then they, say, they, they tell you how it happened and you're like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, that's right. You're right. That is how it happened. Uh, I remember now. Your interjecting friend is trying to protect the integrity of the story, right? They want to assure that the story is being told correctly. And there's a lot of different reasons why we do that. Maybe, maybe you were leaving something out that was really funny and you want to make sure that everybody hears that part of the story. But for whatever reason, they interjected because they wanted to protect the integrity of the story. You know, all of us like to protect the things that are important to us. You realize this, right? We're very protective. How do, you know, how do you know when something is important to you? Well, you know when something is important to you by the way that you protect it. By the way that you protect it. If, you don't, if you're not careful about something, if it doesn't mean a whole lot to you, uh, you'll leave it out in the yard and the next day it's gone and you'll be like, well, praise the Lord, I don't have to throw that away now. Um, you know, if, if you don't care, you don't protect it. But if it's important to you, you're going to put that, that thing away. You're not going to leave that new John Deere tractor sitting out by the curb. Uh, that, that would probably fit better in Virginia because the lawns here are much smaller than, than they are here. Um, you're not going to leave that electric lawnmower <laughs> out there in the front yard, whatever you use, because it's important to you. We protect the things that we value. We lock our homes at night to protect our belongings and our loved ones. We put locks on our storage doors to keep others out and to keep the valuable things inside safe. We lock our car doors when we get out of them and run into the store somewhere. Why? Because we want to protect the car. We want that car to be there when we come back and whatever belongings are in there, we want to be there. Someone um, recently posted on my Facebook page, uh, a member of the congregation, it may have been Kathy, Kathy Hammond, that was commenting on the fact that where we live is close in proximity to where they live. And, and I, I, you know, my wife and I are from Texas very different culture, although we spent, I spent eight years here in Ventura. Um, and so I just put what I would normally put, well, hey, you know what? The door's open. You come on over any time. Like Motel 6, we'll leave the light on for you, you know? And uh, Jim Monteveros, who we affectionately call Mr. O, who, by the way, is my favorite deacon. I know, some of you are out there, wait a second, you can't say things like that. Let me clarify. First of all, He's the only one that I know right now. I don't know who the other deacons are in the church. Um, and secondly, um, he told me to say that. Now, um, Mr. O saw that comment and he said, hey, you're not in Virginia anymore. You better lock that door. <laughs> you're not in Kansas anymore. Um, better close that door. We, we protect the things that are valuable to us. Well, the most valuable thing to the Apostle Paul was the good news of Jesus Christ. The message. When Jesus confronted Paul on the road to Damascus, it completely changed him. Changed his name from Saul to Paul. Changed the direction. He went from being the great persecutor of the church to the great planter of churches. It changed his life completely and it became the, the, the driving force in his life. It was incredibly valuable, more valuable than anything else to Paul. He treasured the good news. He was willing to protect it with the same vigor and the same vitality with which he once persecuted the church. And since that day, he was completely engulfed by the love and grace of God, which was made available by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. I want to ask you a convicting question this morning for myself as well as for you. Is the gospel valuable to you? Is the good news of Jesus Christ really valuable to you? And if so... Are you protecting it? Are you protecting it the way that you're called to? Did you know that protecting the gospel is a responsibility of every believer? The integrity of the message? It's part of our calling. It's part of what we do. Consider these verses. In Luke 9, 23, Jesus is speaking. He says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Take up the cross daily. Protecting the gospel is a part of taking up the cross. In Matthew 22, 
Verse 36 through 40, this is where the, the young man comes to Jesus and he says, hey, what's the greatest command? And Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. I submit to you today that when you love someone, when, when we love someone, we protect them. Do we not? When you love someone, the things that are important to them become important to you. And that's how you show them that you love them. Jesus said that we should love the Lord our God with all our heart, our soul, and our mind. And I would like to say to you this morning that if we're going to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, and all our mind, then protecting the integrity of the gospel, the good news, the best news ever, is something that has to be a part of who you are as a believer and who I am. Our text today is 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 13. 2 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 13. This is, in fact, a continuation of the message that I brought to you back in March. And I'm thankful for the opportunity to be able to continue with this. These verses say, Paul is speaking to Timothy. You remember the situation. He's in prison. He's not getting out this time. I think Paul just knows because he just has a feeling or maybe the Spirit of God has just made it clear to him, Paul, you're not getting out this time. Um, And so he's writing this letter to Timothy and to the church in Ephesus. And this is what he says. He says, you then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he completes, unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, Timothy, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with change as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they may that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is trustworthy. For if if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Let's pray. Father, today we, we come before you around your word, we gather around your words as believers and and perhaps some that are here investigating. Father, we just give this time to you. I thank you for the opportunity to be the person that gets to open up your word today, for the privilege. I pray, Father, you would bless the reading of your word, the teaching of your word, and that it would be true to the meaning of your word, Father. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I want to share real quickly with you this morning what I think are three disciplines that every Christian has to practice in order to protect the best news ever. Three disciplines that every one of us must practice. The first discipline is this. It's humility. We must practice humility. Humility we show when we recognize where our strength comes from and what our limitations are and perhaps where our weaknesses begin. Paul tells Timothy, you then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. I want to park for a second on this you then phrase because it has a familiar ring to it. It sounds a whole lot like when Paul says, therefore. And if you know Paul, you know that Paul often uses literal experiences And he builds his truths and his arguments one at a time, one on the other, building a wall of truth to the point that a person cannot deny that what he's telling them is the truth. He builds a wall like a cinder block wall and uses the mortar of truth that holds them together. I like to think when he's he's finished building his arguments, uh, he might look at whomever he's addressing and use one of my son's favorite expressions, and say, boom, baby. Now try to tear that down. 
It's what we call, or what people call in this, uh, our, our culture now in vernacular, it's what they call a, a, a mic drop moment. Have you heard this phrase? It's like, I'm done. Boom. Take that. See if you can defeat that truth. Boom, baby. Come on. Bring it. Now, Paul probably didn't have that kind of attitude, but it sure is fun to think of him saying that, isn't it? In the various different settings that he was in and, and preaching in. But Paul grabs Timothy's attention by addressing him emphatically, and he directs his next words directly to the young pastor whom he refers to as his son in the ministry. He says, you then, Timothy, be strong. Be strong in what? In your own strength? With the power of positive thinking? By believing in yourself? Maybe if you just believe in yourself enough, Timothy, you can do this? Heavens, no. Paul says, Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Paul knows a whole lot about grace, does he not? He knows who he was before Jesus got a hold of him on that road to Damascus. If anybody understands how weak and frail the human constitution is, it's Paul. He understands. Remember what he wrote. I can do all things through my own strength because I am strong. Right? No? Okay. I'm sorry. Let me try again. He said, I can do all things through my ability to think positively about any situation. Still not right? Well, how about this? I can do all things through Him, meaning Jesus Christ, because He strengthens me. Does that sound right? Okay. John R.W. Stott has said of this exhortation that Paul is making to Timothy, of course, if it had stopped there, it would have been futile, even absurd. He might as well have told a snail to be quick or a horse to fly, uh, to fly as command a man as, timid as, as Timothy to be strong. It is not a summons to Timothy to be strong within himself, to set his jaw and grit his teeth, but to be inwardly strengthened by means of the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Timothy is to find his resources for ministry, not in, the, not in his own nature, but in the grace of Jesus Christ. Can I tell you something this morning? And you may not like this, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share it with you anyway, so maybe I will be, maybe I won't be here tomorrow. Um, when you think you can't do something and you're not strong enough, you're right. When you think that you, there's, you can't do anything else, when you've had enough, you're right. When you're at your wit's end and you've prayed and nothing's changing and you think, maybe if I just do this or if I do that, but when you get to the place when you finally realize, there's, there's nothing else I can do. I can't change this situation. You're right. You can't. But God can. If we had the strength to be holy, righteous, and pure within ourselves, then the death of Jesus was unnecessary. And God is not a gracious, loving, kind Father. He'd be nothing more than a cruel and oppressive sadist who enjoyed watching the pain of others. But praise God, because he's not a cruel and morbid dictator from on high. Remember back in chapter 1, verse 7, he tells Timothy that God didn't give you a spirit of fear, but one of power. It is through this power that all things can be accomplished. Of this phrase, Charles Swindoll says, the be strong here comes from a passive verb that literally means to empower. When Paul said to Timothy, be strong, it also is an imperative verb, which means the verb is best translated like this, keep being empowered. Keep being empowered. That means that each and every day when you wake up and God's mercies are new, you believe that, right? 
Every day, His mercies are new. Keep being empowered. Not because of your strength, not because of anything within yourself, your vitality, your ability to change a situation, but because of God. I better not do that again. (laughs) You and I aren't called to be like Samson with some kind of supernatural physical power. We're called to be like Jesus and to grow in our spiritual power. Spiritual strength. That is why Paul started his letter by telling Timothy, I know you're afraid, man. I know you're afraid. But you don't have to try to do this in your own strength. Because God's given you His strength. And because of this, you can do it. Not through yourself, but through Him. Real quickly, two other disciplines, because we're just about out of time. You've got to practice the discipline of humility, but you also have to practice the discipline of reflection. If you look, uh, if you look back in the verses there, he tells him to consider what he said. Think over what I say, because the Lord's going to give you understanding in everything. This is the idea of thinking over a matter carefully and considering it well. And then he gives Timothy three metaphors. A soldier, an Olympic athlete, and a farmer. The soldier is laser focused on their job, right? Timothy, be focused on protecting the gospel. Don't let anything else distract you from what's important. The gospel is the most important thing, Timothy. Hairu Onada was an imperial Japanese army intelligence officer who fought in World War II. He was a holdout at the end of the war. He and a group of other men knew that the war was over. They'd been notified, but they didn't believe it. They thought it was a plot of the Allies to draw them out and they would take them into captivity. Hairu Onada held out for... Oh, shh, It's not over yet. Shh. Something's wrong with the phone. Out of whack. Hairu Onada and held out. You know how, does anybody in this room know how long he held out? Roland? 1970s. 1974. 1974. The war ended in 1945. He and his buddies held out in the Philippines, out in the, uh, what do you call it, the rainforest or whatever they have there. He, they held out for 29 years. A soldier of the emperor. He finally said, even though he'd been told over and over, the war's over, you can come out, the war's over. He said, I will not not give up, I will not resign my post until my commanding officer comes and tells me to. And they found his commanding officer and flew him to the Philippines, and he told him, and that's when he surrendered. 29 years. Paul is telling Timothy, be a good soldier. Hold out. Stick to the truth, man. Protect the gospel with everything that you've got. It's the most important thing. He also says, have the dedication of Olympian. The dedication of Olympian. In the Olympics back in those days, every athlete had to take an oath that they had trained for at least 10 months prior to competing in the games. If they didn't, if they didn't take that oath, they weren't allowed to compete. Any athlete who had not subjected himself to the necessary discipline, would have no chance of winning and would, in fact, lower the standard of the games. So what is Paul saying? Have the dedication of of an Olympian. Adhere to the fixed truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Stay true to the word, Timothy. Protect the truth by sticking to it. And finally, he says, have the diligence of a farmer from sunup to sundown and usually before that. And long after that, the farmer is diligent. Work hard, Timothy, and don't give up. The final discipline that you and I have to practice if we're going to protect the gospel is remembering. You've got to have a spirit of humility. You've got to take time to reflect on the gospel. You know, a big part of that is reflecting on what Jesus has done for us, right? How can you not 
How can you not want to serve Christ when you think back and reflect for any period of time on what Jesus Christ did for you on that hill that day when he died for your sin and paid that penalty? Reflect. And then you've got to remember. Remember what, Paul? You've said a lot of things. I can't remember everything, Timothy says to him. What is it that you want me to remember? Uh, like a husband that runs the errand to the grocery store, right? Milk and eggs. What was that you needed? Toilet paper? Cleaner? Oh, milk and eggs. We need to know what we must remember lest we remember incorrectly and buy into the wrong thing. In verse uh, 8, Paul says, Remember Jesus Christ. Remember Jesus Christ. This is my gospel. And I endure everything for the sake of the elect that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Part of the gratitude of faith is to remember the past acts of divine inheritance. Many of you have probably read through your Bibles multiple times. You know what you find when you read through your Bible? You find God remembering and, and pointing back to the Passover over and over and over again to help people remember what he's done for them. Over and over again, it's in there. In the New Testament, Paul refers to it, and, and in the Old Testament, it's scattered throughout the book. Remember what God did. When we remember, we do two things. We relive we relive those moments. We relive the emotion of the moment. The experience itself. The emotions and the cognitive recognitions that we had in that moment. You can go back to a time and remember. Many of you probably remember where you were when you first heard the news of 9-11. In the same way, we can remember positive things that have happened. Happy memories that you have. And you, when you think about those and you remember them, you relive that moment. And secondly, you retell it. You retell it because you've got so much joy in your heart about this positive moment that you tell other people about it, correct? That joy causes us to retell. It is good for us to remember what Christ has done for us so that we relive the experiences and we retell the story of how he rescued us. In the end, when the dust is settled, Paul's message to Timothy and to us is not really just about the importance of humility, reflection, and remembrance. You know what it, he's really doing? He's telling, they're a means to an end. That's all it is. Do these things, Timothy. Remember you're weak. Be humble. Have humility. You can't do it on your own. If you try, you're going to fail. Reflect, Timothy. Reflect on what Jesus has done for you. Remember. Take time to remember. Those three things are a means to an end of what Paul's really trying to get at, which is to protect the best news ever. If you want to protect the best news ever, we've got to do those three things. We've got to do them. They're disciplines that we have to practice. I'll leave you with these words from a song. It speaks of that which erroneous, an erroneous message about the gospel, and it ends with what is the truth about the gospel. Some say, don't give up and just hope that your good is good enough. Keep your head down. Keep on working. If you can earn it, you deserve it. Some say, just push on through the challenges. After all, it's the least you can do. But don't buy what everybody's selling because that couldn't be further from the truth. Some say, don't ask for help, because God helps the ones who help themselves. Press on, get it right, because otherwise you're going to get left behind. Some say, he's keeping score, so try really hard, and then try a little bit more. But hold up. If this were true, can someone explain to me what the cross was for? What if I were the one to tell you today that the fight's already been won? I think your day's about to get better. What if I were the one to tell you 
that the work's already been done. It's not good news. It's the best news ever. Let's pray. Father, you've called us ambassadors for you. Representatives of you and the time that we have as we journey on this earth. And with that ambassadorship, there comes expectation and responsibility. And this world needs us to fulfill our responsibilities and to meet those expectations. So many years removed from the issues that the church in Ephesus was facing and the challenges that Timothy had on his hands, we still find ourselves with challenges. Even now, our own state is trying to tell us what we can and can't preach from our pulpits. And we as believers must stand strong. But we must recognize that we don't have the strength to do it within ourselves. We must be filled with humility. We must take time to reflect. And we must remember. Father, I pray if there's anyone in this room today who has never, never heard of the good news of what you've done for them, how you've sacrificed your life for them to make them whole and to give them an eternal hope. Father, I pray today that they would come to someone, come to me or come to one of the leaders here, Lord, and, and speak to them and let them know, I'd like to know more. May today be the day that they find the truth of your grace and the truth of the gospel. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.